The Cold War, as we're all coming to realize by now, was a decades-long struggle for ideological and geopolitical power that cost the lives of millions around the world. Dominated by the two superpowers, each formed alliances and blocks of influence in order to help further their own cause. The United States drove for the establishment of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, in 1949, centered around Article 5 of the treaty, ensuring that in the event one country was attacked, that the other nations in the alliance would intervene to assist that nation. Now, NATO has long been credited as a key part of what kept the European peace until the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. However, it shouldn't come as any great surprise to most of you that the relationship between different members of the NATO alliance was sometimes fractious. So much so that two key members of the alliance were in direct conflict with each other. Well, sort of. And, well, the source of that conflict? Well, fish. I'm your host David, and today we're going to examine how the United Kingdom and Iceland fought over one of the ugliest fish in the sea, the humble cod. This is the Cod War. I mean, the Cold War. During the Second World War, naturally, Iceland was still technically a Danish territory, but was first occupied by British forces, and then by US forces, as its strategic location in the North Atlantic was deemed vital to the war effort. 1944 saw Iceland vote for independence, and by 1949 they had decided to remain inside the Western defensive sphere and join NATO. 1951 saw Iceland sign a defensive agreement with the United States, turning over defense of the island to the Americans from their base at Keflavik outside of the capital, Reykjavik. Nothing new here, we covered all this in our episode on Scandinavia oh so very long ago. But this is all important for what we're about to talk about. But first, a little bit about Iceland. Historically, the island has been largely dependent on its fishing industry. 11% of the island is permanently frozen, and the rest of the land is relatively unsuited for extensive agriculture. It also lacks any profitable natural resources, as in the ones that can be exported. So fishing was it. Between 1881 and 1976, the fishing industry accounted for 89.7% of Icelandic exports. Fish were clearly a big deal. But of course, Iceland wasn't the only country interested in the vast fishy resources of the North Atlantic. The United Kingdom also had communities which were largely dependent on the North Atlantic fisheries, towns like Grimsby, Fleetwood, and Hull. In the 1950s and 1960s, Britain was consuming upwards of 430,000 tons of cod every year, much of it taken from the rich fishing grounds south of Iceland. That is a lot of fish and chips, and I'm sure most of you can see where this is going. A few words about territorial limits and maritime law. To say that the history of territorial limits is long and complicated is an understatement. Modern attempts to define national sea borders go at least as far back as the 18th century and the Dutch jurist Cornelius van Binderschoek, who suggested that national territorial control should extend one cannon shot away from land. That is three nautical miles, or approximately 5.5 kilometers, for anybody who isn't super into naval artillery. For almost two centuries, this was the general rule and was widely applied. That is, until territorial extensions began to occur, a practice which increased after 1945. This began by an extension of territorial waters out to 12 nautical miles, or 22.2 kilometers from shore, but some countries claimed as much as 50 nautical miles, and then as far as 200 nautical miles. The United States went so far as to claim control over all natural resources on its continental shelf. And how did all this apply to Iceland? Well, the 1901 Anglo-Dutch Territorial Waters Agreement defined Iceland's territorial waters as extending three nautical miles from shore. Icelanders were not overly happy with the limited range and the seemingly ever-present British fishing vessels in what many considered their waters. The concern was that the British would overfish, depleting cod stocks and running the risk of collapsing the fishery on which they depended. This would obviously have been devastating for Iceland, so it was decided that steps needed to be taken. In 1949, Iceland made the decision to suspend the Anglo-Danish Territorial Waters Agreement 
and claim one additional nautical mile of ocean territory on the north side of the island. Of course, the overall impact to the British was marginal, since they mostly fished the waters to the south of Iceland. While this was going on, mind you, a fishing dispute between Norway and the UK was being reviewed by the International Court of Justice. British trawlers were fishing the ocean territory claimed by Norway, and there had been several incidents between vessels. The British government appealed the situation to the ICJ, and in 1951, a verdict was delivered. The ICJ ruled that Norwegian territorial claims were consistent with international law and ruled in favour of the Norwegians. Iceland, in light of the court's ruling, extended their claim of four nautical miles to include the waters around the entire island, including to the south. By 1952, conflicts between Icelandic and British fishing vessels were on the rise. The British government, knowing that the majority of Icelandic fishing exports were to the UK, decided to ban the import of Icelandic fish. The idea was to force Iceland to submit to allowing British fishing in their waters or risk collapsing the Icelandic economy. Things looked grim for Iceland until Cold War geopolitics stepped in. In an effort to destabilize their relationships between NATO members, the Soviet Union came forward and agreed to buy Iceland's fish. The United States, in reaction to Soviet involvement, agreed to buy the fish instead of the Soviet Union and even got several other nations, including Spain and Italy, to do the same. Suddenly, the impact of British sanctions was far less severe. By 1956, the British conceded to their defeat and agreed to the four nautical mile limit claimed by Iceland. So all's well that ends well. Well, no, actually. Iceland, emboldened by its success and wanting to secure its economic prospects, decided to pursue further territorial claims. On September 1st, 1958, Iceland implemented a decision to expand its sea territory further, from 4 nautical miles to 12 nautical miles. This time, they were met with a lot of clap back. Get it? Iceland? Clap? Anybody? No? Anyway, NATO member states condemned Iceland's unilateral move and the United Kingdom decided to take a more decisive stance in response. Unlike 1952, London decided to dispatch the Royal Navy to the region to protect British fishing interests. According to the First Lord of the Admiralty, Lord Carrington, by February of 1960, 53 different warships had taken part in patrols off the coast of Iceland, tasked with preventing the Icelandic Coast Guard from interfering with British trawlers in the disputed areas. Iceland, with only eight vessels, was ill-equipped to defend against the British. In Iceland itself, people took to the streets, protesting in front of the British Embassy. The British Embassy's response to this is actually quite humorous, as the ambassador chose to loudly play British patriotic music and military marches on his gramophone. Shades of empire and all that. Okay, so what does all this look like then on the high seas? Well, as we just indicated, it was pretty one-sided. The Royal Navy was effectively in control from the outset. The fortunate thing was that there was no really dangerous incidents or bloodshed. In fact, the First Cod War ended without any casualties. Well, unless you count British finances. Maintaining a fleet presence in the confrontation area was an expensive endeavour, however it allowed the British to maintain the upper hand. Anytime the Icelandic authorities would try and stop a British vessel, the Royal Navy would intervene and help the British ship to avoid any serious harassment. So, if you're Iceland, lacking the ability to stand up to the formidable opponent that was the Royal Navy, well, what could you do? Well, you play the hand you have and leverage the situation via other means. Iceland threatened to leave NATO and expel US troops from the island. For the alliance as a whole, and especially for the US, the threat of losing access to Iceland's key strategic position was unthinkable. Keep in mind that Iceland is the middle part of the so-called GI-UK gap, from which monitoring of Soviet naval exits from their Arctic ports to the Atlantic had to happen. Loss of control of the Greenland-Iceland-UK gap would mean the possibility of unfettered Soviet access to Atlantic shipping routes, so Iceland found its trump card and played it. NATO stepped in to mediate a solution between the two member nations. Unfortunately for the UK, the mediation by NATO and the 1958 ratification of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea all found in favour of Iceland 
and the United Kingdom was forced to stand down in its claims to access to the Icelandic fishing grounds. According to the Convention of the Law of the Sea, the, quote, contiguous zone may not extend beyond 12 miles from the baseline from which the breadth of the territorial sea is measured, end quote. This effectively legitimized Iceland's claims and the UK conceded. Iceland did agree, however, to continue to allow limited British fishing in their new territorial waters, the part between 4 and 12 nautical miles, for a limited period of time, and thus ended the First Cod War. Yes, that's right, the First Cod War. There would be two more wars fought between the UK and Iceland in the 1970s as Iceland continued to press its claims. The First Cod War is an interesting yet often overlooked story in the narrative of the Cold War. A small nation stood up to another that wielded considerably more power and won. It didn't matter that the UK was a permanent member of the Security Council or that they had nuclear weapons, or even that the two nations were allies. Instead of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a giant, it instead leveraged its strategically important geographic position, international law, its own alliances, and even Cold War geopolitics in order to bloodlessly win a victory over its nominal ally. Britain, clearly able to read the cards, simply had to stand down. It knew that when push came to shove, Iceland's strategic position and diplomatic relationships would win out over British fishing. We hope you've enjoyed today's topic, and to make sure you don't miss future episodes, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and have caught the bell button, hook, line, and sinker. We can also be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com, and we're active on Facebook and Instagram at The Cold War TV. If you enjoy our work, please consider supporting us via Patreon at www.patreon.com slash thecoldwar or through YouTube membership. This is the Cold War Channel, and don't forget, the trouble with the Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it becomes heated.